mercy. These stories have just been weird, you know? But I'm not going to do that. I'm just going to tell y'all some regular stories, send everybody home happy. <laughs> oh, mercy. Mercy. Mm. I met uh, Esseline Tubby in 1993 with a friend of mine, Doc Moore. I drove a van. I was uh, heading to Philadelphia, Mississippi, capital of Choctaw Nation in Mississippi. I was heading there, and I went to the museum. I figured they're going to know where some of these older Choctaws live. I've been tape recording Choctaw stories in Texas, Oklahoma, and I knew if I really wanted to, I had to get back to the homeland. Misha is a Choctaw word meaning place, like home place. Sippy means old, so when you say Mississippi, you say an old home place in Choctaw. A fellow named Robert Ferguson, he'd married a Choctaw lady, and he was director of that Choctaw Culture Museum. And he kind of visited with me a little bit, and we'd have coffee a little bit. And, but he wouldn't tell me where any of these older people lived. And finally, he asked me out for breakfast, and I had breakfast with him. And he said, well, you've been here a few days. I, it's really been nice getting to know you. I said, yeah, okay. I wasn't ready to go. And so right about closing time, I went back to the museum. He'd already taken off, and his, his wife, Martha Ferguson, who's Choctaw, I walked in, and she said, well, I, you hadn't, I thought, I thought Robert said bye to you this morning. I said, yeah, but he said it in English. He didn't say Chapisolachiki, so I didn't leave. And she smiled and she said, I was hoping you'd come back. And she took me into a back little room that I hadn't seen and it was, it had wooden things on the walls and it wasn't like a regular museum. It was like a, kind of like an old home. It just, I don't know. And she said, there's a woman, Esteline, tubby, she just lived a few blocks from here, and I think she might have a story or two. Wanna go see her? I said, yeah. She said, uh, she said, now you go, you you go visit with her tonight, but you're not gonna really visit. Be there right about about sundown, and just go, kind of knock on the door. She's not gonna open the door. But just knock on the door and mention something about you'd like to visit with her. She's not going to let you in, but she's going to look at you. And then you just stand there for a minute and you just back away and drive on off. If she has a dream about an owl, you're never going to see her again. And it's time for you to leave. But you come back the next day about 10 o'clock in the morning and she'll let you know that door will be locked or it'll be open. You'll know. I'm telling you what happened. I'm playing my drum and it's a story, but I'm telling you what happened. Esseline Tubby. <laughs> So I drove over there and I knocked on the door and, and I just stood there and I said, Miss Tubby, I'd like to hear some of your stories if it's okay. And then I, I just stood there and I didn't know if anybody was looking through. I didn't know, but I've been told to stand there and then drive away and so I did as I was told. The next morning, right about 10 o'clock, I pulled into the driveway and as I was walking up to the house, the, the door just opened and there she was standing in beautiful traditional Choctaw dress and she had a smile on her face and she welcomed me in. 
she let me turn a little tape recorder on and I recorded her about an hour and I just shut up and she was just telling me one thing after another and me and Esteline, I'd go about two, three times a year and I'll never forget one time I got there in the morning and she said, you need to come back at night. I said, about what time? She said, about nine o'clock. She'd never done that before. So I pulled in about eight o'clock and I knocked on the door and she kind of opened it. She said, you're an hour early. I ain't ready for you. Come back at 10. <laughs> so I did. I came back at 10 o'clock. And it was moving into the fall then. And I always sat with her at her little breakfast table, and that's where we always talked and visited. I'd never been outside in her yard. I knew that right behind her was a swamp. So I come back about 10 o'clock at night. She opened the door. There were no lights on in the house. The door was open, and I could hear her walking, and so I just followed what I heard. And I heard the back door open, and I kind of stepped through it, and she was sitting at a wooden table, just a concrete back porch with screened in all around it. You could hear the mosquitoes just buzzing. You could hear things out in the swamp. She had my coffee cup there for me. She was drinking iced tea. And I knew not to say anything. I knew it was time for me to listen. She didn't say anything for the longest time. And then I heard this. Kind of this claw and scratching sound off into the swamp. And Esteline said, <laughs> It surprised me too. It did. It surprised me too. She said, That old alligator, he's out there. He's clawing on that tree. Ooh, big old oak tree growing right there in the water swamp. That old alligator, he out there. One of these days, he's going to claw that tree right on down. He's going to do it. I didn't say a word. <laughs> she said, I was a little girl. Me and my little sister, we'd go to school. We had, oh, many miles to walk to school. And there's a lady named Lizzie, and she had her hubby. And they lived on one side of the street. My mom always said when we started to go to school, she said, when you go to school, don't you walk in front of Libby's house. She said, you walk in the woods all the way around. Don't get too close to Libby, because, you know, her, her husband, he... He talked off from, he not from around here and he not good to her and sometimes she'd be screaming and everything and y'all going to school. He said, I don't know what that meant, but every time, every once in a while we'd be walking by that house and we'd go into the woods. We wouldn't walk in front of her house and every once in a while we'd hear some crying and some screaming inside. We've been told he wasn't good to her. And so one time it got so bad that Lizzie heard she went down to the first place you'd go to see if you can get things taken care of. Went to the tribal council and there was a, a council was a meeting. Everybody knew what was going on. Everybody, all the grown up knew what was going on in her house. And She said, if there's somebody that can come help me and maybe talk to my husband, please give it a shot. Please try it. And everybody looked at each other. They didn't want to go down and talk to him, but there was a new councilman there and he he was just elected, and they said, well, why don't we let you, let him go? And he felt like, oh, he'd get him some really important job because he was from a different town. He didn't know yet about Libby's husband, Lizzie. So that Saturday morning, he come down, and he, uh, he had a brand-new hat on, one of these kind of Western hats. In Choctaw culture, you don't just open a gate and walk up and knock on somebody's nor you don't do that not in the old days you'd stand at the gate until the dog or somebody said it's all right come on your land your your house your property that's the way to do it and so he stood there and the lizzie's husband opened the door and he looked at him and he said what you want 
He said, well, I just kind of wanted to come visit with you and, and, uh, and your wife Lizzie, if, if that's all right. And he said, oh, you want to come visit with me and my wife Lizzie? You want to come visit with me? That's what you want? Yeah, that's all right. He said, yeah, you just wait right there just a second. And he reached back in and he picked up his shotgun. Pow! And he busted right that, that guy's head. He just shot it right off of his head. And the, and the guy turned around, boy, shoo, he took off running. He didn't come back, neither. I say it was not good for Lizzie what, after her husband heard that she asked somebody to come talk to him. So she went to the next place. She went down to the preacher. She went to church every Sunday, and he only went a couple of times a year. The old preacher said, well, okay, I'll be down Saturday morning. So he come down Saturday morning, and he stood at the gate. He didn't say a word. He just stood there waiting. As his husband pushed the door open, said, oh, preacher man, you come talk to me, didn't you? You come talk to me about me and Lizzie. That's what you want to visit about. The preacher said, yeah, I did. He said, well, you just wait right there. And as he reached back in the house, the preacher realized he had a nice new hat on, so he took it off and he put it right in front of his chest. Lizzie's husband got that shotgun and he aimed it. And the preacher kind of stepped back. So he aimed it at the limb right up. Pow! And he shot that limb. And that limb fell down. And as the preacher backed away and took off running, he grabbed his hat and he didn't come back neither. He was gone. He was gone. It was not a good week for Lizzie. It was not a good week. And so she walked by the council house and she walked by the church and she kept on walking. And there was an elite man who gathered herbs, a medicine man who gathered herbs and she looked at him and she just walked on by and she went way too far out to the swamp to that, that woman that lived way back here. That woman that had other ways of doing things. And when she saw Lizzie coming, she said, come on in, I've been waiting for you for a long time. Come on in, have a seat. She had this little bowl made out of clay and she was crushing something in it. She put it in a little bag and she said, here, you take this bag and tomorrow morning you sprinkle it on his eggs. It's going to change. And Lizzie started to ask what's going to happen, but then the woman said, So she went back home. He come in late and he, she cooked some eggs and she sprinkled it on it. And she pushed the plate over. When he got up, he, he looked down and he said, they look like the dirt, filthiest eggs I ever. He always said bad things about anything she cooked or anything she did. And he sat down and he got a fork and he, and he put it in his mouth. And all he said, he said, well, these are the, this is good, Lizzie. This is good. Where'd you learn to cook like that? And Lizzie tried to smile, but she couldn't, and he ate all those eggs. And he said, I'm going to go hunting today. And he picked up his gun, and as he walked out, he turned back around and said, you're a good cook. You, you're good. I'll, have, I'll bring something home for you to cook. And he left. And he come back. And Lizzie kept a little bit of it, a little bit of that powder. He caught a big old hawk and he went out and cooked it over the fire and she cooked the meat and he sprinkled a little bit of it on his slice of meat. He took a bite of it and he said, boy, that's some good cooking. That is good. I think I need to go to sleep now. I believe I'm going to go to sleep. So he, he lay in bed with all his clothes on and she thought, well, he's just going to take a little nap, but he didn't. She lay her blanket over in the corner. She didn't crawl into bed and she went to sleep. And sometime after midnight, they say, he woke up and his eyes were big and they were flashing back and forth. And his muscles just started vibrating. And he, he tried to 
lift his legs up and he tried to move his arms and he tried to pull the covers up, but he couldn't move. His muscles were vibrating so much and finally he just rolled out of bed on the floor and he could see things with his eyes, but he couldn't control anything that was happening. And his heels dug into the, into the floorboards and he, he, he backed up and he kept backing up until finally he was standing up. And he felt his legs start to move and his arms were moving and he couldn't control it. He was inside his body and looking what was happening, but he couldn't control anything. And then he, and he stumbled kind of turning this way and that way and he made his way out the door and he, he pushed the door open with his shoulder and backwards and he half stumbled down the steps and she didn't even get up to watch. She didn't want to see what was happening. Then the gate always opened pushing forward, but he was leaning against the gate and he couldn't stop it. And finally he just busted it off the hinges and he was walking out into the street and he, and he couldn't stop him. He was walking down the street and he tried digging his heels in, but he couldn't stop it because the swamp wasn't far up ahead. And then he saw the swamp water and then he felt the mud on his feet and he couldn't stop it. And then the, the water was up to his ankles and he couldn't stop. And the fear was in his eyes, but he couldn't stop. And he moved up to his knees and then up to his hips and then up above his belly button and up to his chest. And he was walking deeper and deeper into the swamp water. And finally, he tilted his head back and he kept walking until finally all that was left of him was the blub, 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 blub of four green bubbles rising to the top of the swamp. They say they never found his body. And a few months went by. Lizzie never said nothing to nobody about what she'd done. And she didn't know this was happened, but she knew that once you go back deep in the swamp to that Alixie woman, you got no control over what's going to happen. And they say after a while, the, the church people, they, he, he was dead according to the Choctaws. He was gone and he was dead. And Lizzie was there without a husband. Not long after that, coming from that same down road from the swamp, come a black man. This was Choctaw country. He was African American man. He come walking down there and Lizzie had always stepped through that gate since then. She'd never even have that gate fixed. And he looked up at her and she was sitting on the front porch. He said, ma'am, you want me to fix your gate? And something about the way he looked, she thought, well, yeah, if you want, and I don't have no money, but I can fix you something to eat. And he said, well, that's good, because I'm passing through. I could use that. And so he, he kind of fixed the gate and nailed it a little bit, and he had some tools in the pack. And, and then when he shut the gate, he was standing on the inside of it. And she said, come on around back. And on the back porch, she had a bowl of pashofa which is our sacred Choctaw stew. It's not something you just feed to anybody. It was Peshofa, our corn soup stew. And he ate it and he looked out at the garden and he said, look like you got some good plants out there, but boy, there's sure a lot of weeds. And she said, yeah, and I got all that lumber back there, but nobody been chopping it. Winter coming, it's getting cold. She said, if you want to, you can sleep out there under the trees. There's a place where it's almost like a little room. It's outside, but you can sleep out there, and, and I'll cook you meals here. I don't have no money for you, but I can keep you fed, and you can stay the winter out there. And he said, if I can build a fire out there, she said, sure. So he began to weed the garden. He began to chop the wood. He began to fix the roof. Every meal he ate on the back porch. And then finally, she said one morning, won't you come have breakfast? Come on inside. You can come on have breakfast inside. And he did. And that next Sunday, they went to church together. And it wasn't long after that before she went down to the preacher and she said, I, I, I want to marry him. And the preacher said, we give you your blessing. 
we give a blessing. He's a good man. So they both start coming to church. They got married. Had a little baby. Beautiful little baby. And the Choctaws, they welcomed that. But this was Mississippi. Not everybody welcomed that. And when word wandered all around, men showed up one night. He was gone on a hunting trip, said he'd gonna be gone two, three days. And men showed up one night, wearing their hoods and their white sheets. They kicked that gate open. They banged their rifles up against the door. And they said, where is he? We want him. Where is he? And Lizzie came. She had a baby in her arms. She said, who you want? We want that man. Where is he? He ain't got no right to be here. Where is he? He got every right to be here. Where is he? He gone hunting. You're lying. He gone hunting. I'm not lying. He gone hunting. When's he coming back? I don't know. It's going to be served. You're lying. And one of them grabbed the baby and tossed that baby up in the air. And another one aimed a shotgun. Pow! And he shot that baby. And she expected blood to rain from the sky. And she ran out, but that's not what happened. Floating up. The baby sheet blanket just scattered everywhere. And then there were fireflies, a thousand beautiful fireflies lifting high. And they were just looking. They couldn't believe it. There wasn't, wasn't a dead baby falling on that yard. There was beautiful fireflies, and they circled everywhere. And then they took the shape of that baby and landed in her arms. And the baby looked up at her, and she looked up. She had her baby back. And the men knew that this was something stronger than they were. So they took off, making their way down the road. And then they saw him coming back. They took the rope and they tied it around his neck. And they dragged him. And they tied him on the limb of an oak tree hanging out over the swamp. They hung him there. One of them hit his legs with a shotgun and he waved back and forth and back and forth. And them 12 men, they went on back, went on back home. They didn't even wait for him to die. They just left him there. They say it took a few days. Esteline was telling me it took a few days. And I took a deep breath and sipped my coffee and then we heard it again. And she said, that old alligator, he clawing on that tree one more time. He clawing on that tree one more time. And I just took another sip of coffee and, and she went on. She said, yeah. And then an alligator come, a big old 16 foot alligator. And he opened his jaws and he had a meal. He had a meal, and he pulled that body down, and that alligator had a meal. But this story don't end there, he said. Because that man, that man, he was still around. He come for a good purpose, and he still had it. And that alligator began to grow arms, long arms, powerful arms, dark arms of that man but it had the claws of an alligator swimming up and down that swamp, up and down that swamp. And it was a few days later that one of them men, just to make sure that that fellow was still hanging from that tree and just out of curiosity, he come back here and it was after dark and he saw the rope hanging from the tree where it had been broken. And then he felt something like he, he stepped into a sticker vine right next to the Swamp, and he felt it wrap around his ankle, and he kind of looked down, and then he felt something else grab his other ankle, and it wasn't no sticker vine. 
It was that Choctaw alligator man, Esteline said, and he swam backwards, and that man slipped, and little by little he swam backwards, and he was fighting and struggling, but that Choctaw alligator man was strong, and finally there was nothing left but the blub, 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 blub of four green bubbles as he became the first victim of the Choctaw alligator man. And she said, one by one, all the men, they come back. All by themselves, for some strange reason, they all come back, she said. Just out of curiosity, just looking for where their friends was, and nobody ever found them. Until finally there was one fellow, the last one of them still alive. And he moved to Colorado, she said. He became a hunting guide out in Colorado. He got to be an old man in his 70s. But then one Christmas, he decided he just had to go back home. He just had to go back home. He had to do it. He was coming back for a reason. And part of him knew it. He told his family that was still living there, he said he gonna go do some wandering. So he dressed in the oldest clothes. He brought them, his old clothes. Then he wandered back just about midnight and he stood there on the side of the swamp and he looked up and that piece of rope was long gone but he just stood there and it was almost a relief when he felt that claw digging into his ankle and then his other ankle and then that alligator man started swimming backwards after all those years and that man fell down and took a deep breath and almost by relief till all that was left was the blub, 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 blub of four rising bubbles as he became the last victim of the Choctaw alligator man. And as Esteline took a sip of her iced tea and I heard it again, that clawing on the tree and I looked at her and she kind of nodded at me and she said, one of these days that alligator gonna claw on that tree enough, that tree gonna fall down, ooh, it gonna fall down. And then she grew real quiet and I looked at her and she said, you know I've known you for all these years but I just want to make sure of one thing. If you come here and you be bringing a way of looking at things, that you're going to be judging people by the color of their skin, you best be careful. You're going to be the next victim of a Choctaw alligator man. Oh, and then it just happened. It just blew up like that. And she said, <laughs> That alligator finally got that tree and fell in the swamp. And I'm telling you, don't come back here bringing them ways of judging folks. Because that tree's gone, but that Choctaw alligator man is still in the swamp. Yeah, okay, thank y'all.